I hear a lot of personal trainers saying, no, you don't need to weigh yourself in order to lose weight. Something actually a while ago, your future self is never as good as what you think it's going to be. Did like, I say that? Something like that, because I'm always That's like, definitely oh. definitely not a quote from me. I think that is good for you, but it will make <laughs> zero difference to your muscle soreness. <laughs> I've got some funny advice on not being sore. My probably number one advice for not being sore is... Welcome back, my name's Tom Pito, this is Sophia Williams. This is our second podcast that we've done, and today we're going to be answering Google's most asked fitness questions. So let's get right into it. We're both personal trainers and we're just giving our opinion on these. How should I measure progress? That was one of the most common questions asked. Okay. So how do you think someone should measure progress? Well, it depends. Okay, so let's say, let's go with, if their goal's fat loss, how do you think that type of person should okay. measure, or weight loss, fat yeah, loss? Yeah, okay, because we want, I do want to bring up as well, people are always exercising or think exercise is for just weight loss, but there's lots of other amazing things that happen. Yeah. So, well, we'll cover so, one and yeah, then Yeah, okay, cool. So weight loss, let's say um, photos are great mm -hmm. for a great visual to see progress over time. Yeah. Um, in, at intervals. Tape measure, measuring different parts of the body. So I have a question. Where would you measure? What are your like key points that you'd key want points, to measure? Key um, points around the navel. Around the hips, biceps, thighs. Yeah, I find I actually find it difficult when you measure around, uh, like in line with your belly button, to just get that same uh, circumference each time. You know, you go a little bit up mm -hmm. or a little bit down, and I find it it can throw the measurement off like three centimeters. So you end up like if you really want someone to have progress, always trying to find like the smallest measurement you can in the later weeks. Also, so, the, they, the round your belly button's a funny one because after you eat food, obviously your tummy's going to expand. Yeah. And if you so breathe out. Yeah, breathing in, breathing out. So, you know, I, that's why I like taking the other measurements as well. Yeah, I actually like, for women, dress size. Now, I know different shops vary, but if they have a dress that they already know is like, oh, this size 12 is a bit tight on me, you know, and then just using that actual dress they already own and they're like you know what this 12 is too big for me now maybe you know now they fit a 10 and for men actually trouser size doesn't vary as much like between shops so if you're a 32 waist in one shop in jeans you're pretty much 32 waist everywhere so you know if you go down well, you don't really need to go down low in the 32 but let's say you're 36 <laughs> and you're going down to a 34 um i think that's actually a really good measure sometimes i find it better than the tape measure and then I also just wait. People okay, yeah, like scale, the scales. You mean? Yeah, yeah, the scales. Yeah, I do find like it, it's gone like obviously the trend's almost gone the other way. Where I hear a lot of personal trainers saying, "No, you don't need to weigh yourself in order to lose weight," and I'm like, that is like insane. Like I agree, <laughs> maybe don't obsess over weighing yourself, but if you're 130 kilos and you're like five foot ten or something like that then the idea that, oh yeah, but you can build muscle, no matter how much muscle they build, they are gonna get lighter when they're at their healthy weight. So I think actually any trainer sometimes that is saying to a very overweight person. Oh yeah, do, they're saying they, don't weigh yourself. Yeah, that if, they shouldn't weigh themselves no. is afraid of not making progress with the client. What do you think? Oh, that's quite a statement. To that, is a, that is a big statement, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, yeah, perhaps. Mm. But I think with every single, if, we go, if you only use one way, you're going to go, what, I'm, what I mean is, I you think we should kind of put them on, yeah, yeah, I feel like using all three um, helps. A hundred percent, yeah, no, I don't, I agree, That's I think I you mean. should take a photo, I think first session, I will take a photo. The only thing with that I find sometimes hard is I feel, some, for some people, it can be quite intrusive, so yeah. I'm like, maybe perhaps do that yourself privately or get a family member to help you with that but some people can find it quite emotionally triggering to be like in front of a camera because it is if they have like a bad body image I think so definitely if they want to take one in like a bikini or whatever something that doesn't suck everything in I ask them to wear fitted but not like tight clothes so not a baggy t-shirt or if a client does have a baggy t-shirt i'm not asking them to like take their t-shirt off yeah. and stuff like that I ask, your first meeting with them i like? ask them to tuck it in and just say this is just for you and just tell them this is just for you so we can show you progress and they don't even have to see that photo we're like we're going to put them in a secure file password protected and we'll show you the change over time so 
I, yeah, I do think, I think most people should take a photo, but not a photo that in their head is going to be like posted mm. on Instagram necessarily. Yeah, I, I find that quite intrusive. I think it's harsh to pressure a client for it, for sure. Mm. But I do think photo, same time of day, same lighting, same spot in the room. I think that's really important. I think if you're in like uh, top down lighting, you can look really ripped. Yeah. As if you go and if you, you've been into a change, have you been in Primark changing You're rooms? Like, Whoa. I'll go into Primark changing rooms and like I'm like, oh my goodness, I look like a thumb. I'm meant to be a personal trainer. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Honestly, I'll be like, feel like I'm looking bloated. It's, it's something about that front lighting yeah. gives no definition You're just whatsoever. Like flat, yeah. so I think the same lighting, same time of day um, for the photo, as well as like same time of day for the weight and um, measuring. What do you think? I don't even know this is one of the questions. What do you think about how often should you weigh yourself if you were trying to lose weight? Uh, how often? Okay, my, I personally, if that is my goal, <laughs> I do weigh myself every day mm -hmm. as soon as I wake up because the, I get fluctuations by, by a pound sometimes, yeah. like day by day. But t you always see it going, da, 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 ooh, da, 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 da. and then you look at the overall picture of the week and that's how I do it for mm. myself personally. Uh, sometimes, if I'm only seeing someone once a week, it'll just be like that once a week weigh yeah. in. Um, but I'm like, if you've got scales, you're welcome to have a look at yourself. And I think it helps keep you on that mindset of eating well, eating healthily. However, I do think also on the other hand, for some people, that can be another triggering... Emotional role. Yeah, so. response. Yeah, so, I think it, weighing yourself every day should, should actually like reduce your anxiety showing that mm. it's normal to go up and down hopefully for people and then i i almost have like all right we're going to have an official weigh-in like once a week or once a fortnight so we're going to weigh every day to check your fluctuations to make sure you go in, in yeah. the right direction like roughly that, yeah. and it and it reduces the anxiety of you know after you've had a lot of water you'll be up down or like a but, big, um, eating some crisps and you're getting yeah, a lot and of salt it gives you a better graph it also yeah. is like if you've done like three days where you've been I don't know, say 85 kilos, and then you suddenly weigh at 88, you don't yeah. freak out because you can see that. And also, like, some people, if you're not weighing them as regularly, this is just another thought, is some people will be like, oh, I'm getting weighed in three days' time. Boom, I'm not going to eat anything for three days yeah. type thing. So it's trying to keep everyone consistent, you know, small changes every day. Yeah. But I just wanted to add as well about, you know, measuring progress because mm -hmm. there are other things that are good. Yeah, so let's move on. So... A lot of the clients I have now, I like to actually train as many people as I can that don't have fat loss goals. Mm. I know that's an odd thing to say, but it's just, that's tough because a lot of it's out of your control as a trainer. Whereas I feel like if their goal is strength, then you, obviously they have to do the work, but as long as they do what you've set, you actually have more control as a trainer over their results. So I prefer that because I can't re I can encourage them with the fat loss stuff, but they ultimately have a large portion of control over that. While as long as they do my workouts the yeah. way I've asked them. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm yeah, lifting like, this. Whereas yeah. four weeks ago, I was, I couldn't even comprehend doing that or being able to do a pull up. I remember yeah. when I first was able to do a pull up, I was like, I can't believe this is happening. And that yeah. just like, felt so good. And that wasn't connected to how I looked that day or yeah. what I weighed that day. Yeah, they're my favorite yeah, my so clients, that was really nice. for sure. And health and well-being. So how well. would you measure it? How would you measure strength? If it's an all-rounder, I guess you just go with all the main movements, don't you? Like squat, checking your squat, bench, checking your deadlift, yeah, your deadlift. push pull. Yeah. All yeah, I'd ways. probably go like barbell. So barbell back squat's a tough one. So barbell back squat I like, but with a new client, I always go for depth goals. So I find like, let's say they're like five rep max mm -hmm. on a barbell back squat. Not absolutely like excruciating max, just you know, keeping a good form. And then let's say they're squatting down to like a 14 inch depth. So maybe they're tapping their bum gently on a 14 inch box. If I don't feel like 14 inches there full depth, my goal for the back squat for them That's is right. actually to get down to 12 or basically just get their back squat down to full range of motion before at their weight that is currently their max before we go up whereas all the other lifts i feel like you know a deadlift mm. is either on the floor or at the top or i think also not. people get drawn to a certain lift you know when they feel like actually i'm pretty good at this move yeah then i like to push that a little bit more and measure that and be like oh my gosh look how good you are at this yeah. weight and then they feel really good about themselves and it inspires them to keep going with all the other moves and obviously progress 
with with that one as well. Yeah, you definitely you want to capitalize on what they enjoy yeah. for sure. So yeah, I'd measure back squat, but focusing partly on depth and strength. Mm -hmm. Deadlift. If it was a beginner, I'd definitely do hex bar deadlift rather than a conventional bar. If they're experienced, conventional deadlift's great. I usually don't do one rep maxes with people. I do like a three rep max. I might give them a predicted one rep max off that. Bench press is a good one because it's just upper body push, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's hard to do like a horizontal pull as a measure, I feel, but I think a chin up, if they're light enough, is a really good yeah, goal. It's just a fun one to have. Yeah. Just how many reps can you do with a green band on a chin up? Let's say they do four. There's really nice, measure. you know, you can go five reps, six reps. When they get up to like around six to eight reps, I'll reduce the band width and pick those. So probably the big compound lifts, squat, deadlift, yeah. bench. Let's go for another question. So this is an interesting one. This was, these are, if you type into Google, just some of the common ones that came up. So it was, how do I stay motivated to work out? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a funny one. We've talked about this before. I've made, not, not I've sort of made videos on this. Yeah, you've mentioned it. And I agree, because motivation, like, comes in ebbs and flows. But I remember you saying something, actually, a while ago. Your future self is never as good as what you think it's going to be. Did like, I say that? Something like that, because I'm always that's like, oh. definitely not a quote from me. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of been... I might have said something like that. No, something like that. You've probably said it in a more intellectual way <laughs> but what i say you know people are like oh next week i'm going to be doing this this, oh, and this. okay you're I, I think i know what you said okay what, what did you say <laughs> people well this is quite common this is what you overestimate what you can do in a year but you underestimate what you can do in five years oh no so, i don't know that. all right that's quite, well, I like, that's quite good but that definitely that relates one. to fitness yeah. if you want to do a chin-up and you're currently coming into the gym overweight with like five bands on yeah, you know, there's nothing wrong with actually taking longer than a year to achieve that chin up. So, but um, for me, I don't think, how do I stay motivated? I don't rely on motivation. That's how I stay motivated. Yeah. Like motivation is fleeting. It will come and go. So I feel like instead of, you can't find time for a workout. If someone's trying to find time for a workout, they won't. You have to make time for it. And all the most successful people that are consistent I've all made time for that work. They haven't like just woke up and thought, shall I go tonight? Shall I not? Yeah, it was never it was never a choice. It was just in the, literally in their diary, in their routine. You know, my client, um, Tori, I don't mind mentioning her because we're saying nice things. You know. Oh, she's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So she's had a kid, another another kid, and um, running a business, super busy. She couldn't make any of the class times. And, you know, she could have just said, I can't make the class times. I'm going to reduce my training. Mm. But instead, we found a way where she can come in and train in the studio yeah. before hours. And she worked and, so hard And as she well. made it work. So she didn't try and find time to work out. Mm. You know, as a busy mom, she didn't find... It's too hard. You have to actually put it in place yeah. somewhere. So she, you don't rely on motivation. It doesn't... I think setting the amount of times you want to be training a week, like set a... A target you can achieve so it's, if it's only twice that week or to begin with you're just getting into it twice a week and when yeah. you start making that part of your routine even when you don't want to go sometimes I think just going through the motions like okay I've got changed I'm in the gym I'm gonna lift a bit you know it it kind of sets that standard that you're gonna keep it's an important slot in your diary yeah and then it just becomes habit because when I before I became a personal trainer and obviously I just had children and I was like I don't I being fit is important to me, but I don't know how I can make this work in my life. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I'm going to have to be a personal trainer because <laughs> then I'll have no <laughs> other option to. But even so, being a personal trainer, it's yeah. still hard to fit it in. So I just break it down into not overwhelming myself. I don't say, right, I'm going to do an hour session. I'm going to burn 400 calories. Or I'm going to get my... Sometimes it's just like, I'm going to promise myself 20 minutes every single day. Mm -hmm. And that 20 minutes always turns into 30 minutes or 35 minutes or hopefully longer, depending on if I haven't, you know, if I've got yeah. a break or, or whatever. Um, so I just set it in my head, make it an achievable amount. So that over time adds up to a big, however many yeah, hours think, a week. I think a big misconception is that people think personal trainers love to work out. Or No, I like working out, <laughs> but I don't always want to work out. Yeah. You know, I think that's the same for anyone. It's like, they're like, oh yeah, but you really like the gym. It's like, no, I learned to like these things. You know, when you get good at something, 
you, you like it more. And like, I'll find a lot of people that are like, oh, I just don't like the gym. They do a few sessions, start seeing oh, progress, yeah, start gaining it. confidence, and they do like it. Now, I'm not saying they want to come to the PT session each time, <laughs> yeah. but by the time they finish... Everyone is always so happy at the end of a PT session. Yeah. Even, when even if you have someone moaning, Phil, at the end they're like, oh, that was really, really good. Yeah, see, see, see. Yeah. Like, and I'm always like, wow, okay. So motivation's great. You know, if you find yourself motivated, I think capitalizing on motivation is great. Mm -hmm. You know, like New Year, I have no problem with being motivated and January and using that spark of motivation to get you going, get you like started. However, if you're trying to rely on that energy to get you to wherever you're trying to it's go, you will not get there because life is just up and down like that. But, you have good days and bad days. Yeah. Let's go. We've got we've got loads more. We won't get through these. So we've got unlimited podcasts because we go through these so slow. <laughs> um, we did some best exercises one yeah. in part one. So Let's go with best exercise. These are the, this is the only one we didn't cover out of this actually. Oh no, there's two. Best exercise for lower back. Lower back. Strength or lower back pain, I guess, lower back pain. due to weakness. So. Okay, I think first of all, you kind of should, you know, we need to say this, go to a doctor because it could just mm. be uh, and something that you've, you know, a little twinge or it could be something more sinister. So it's always good yeah. to get a check a from Assuming that. they haven't got like a herniated disc and they've had that checked, and they've said you yeah. just need to, let's say Strengthen a physio it. said, you need to strengthen your lower back. What, like, they give me three, what, what would be your like top couple of, couple uh, of exercises? I'd focus could... on good glute strength, focus on yeah, deep core good, strength as well, and have a look at posture and what you're doing throughout the day. Because, you know, back, if we're thinking about back, we often think it's our, like our joints and our bones, mm. but. It's, our bones don't move themselves, yeah. muscles move your bones. So have a look at a little muscular imbalance um, and try and work on that a little I bit. Think seating position, variety of seating mm. position throughout the day is important. So everyone's like, what's the best seating position? Or it's like, whatever you weren't doing for the last 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah, that's, that's I heard you say, what, your next one. Yeah. I heard, yeah, so, so like, so I just want to like, Obviously there are bad. Because you get uncomfortable. Yeah. I was like, I'm so comfortable at the start of this. Like, um, I'm going to sit like this, Tom, for the podcast. And I'm like, just kind of want to wiggle. And yeah. I feel more comfortable again. So yeah. it's all about moving. Yeah, so stand, stand up. If you've got standing desk, then you can get kneeling yeah. and sitting. Maybe sit on a BOSU ball for a little bit. Mm. Uh, not BOSU, a Swiss ball for a little bit. <laughs> but, okay, let's go through some actual uh, exercises. Because I can pop these up on the screen. Like, yeah. so people know what we're talking about um so sometimes i think just pelvic tilts as well are good yeah. like lying on the floor or against a wall like, or... uh, i quite like lying on the floor mm -hmm. but actually the the one against the wall is a lot harder do you mean it? without a glute bridge or with a glute bridge to go into like practice that and then go into a glute okay, bridge so i think yeah. about activating like the front abs to lift your your pubic bone up and all then right i've seen some of your videos lifting up that, yeah. yeah lifting up then thinking about glute engagement mm -hmm. so i'm not talking about big massive movements just yeah. like getting that engagement waking those muscles up a little yeah. bit um, teaching how to take yourself out of hyper ex over extension yeah because yeah. obviously it's no perfect posture yeah. is there um but like de dead bug we both like a dead we bug. love a dead bug i was like can i mention that again you can but definitely mention a like... dead bug we we're talking about lower back pain yeah. though so yeah um i feel like that helped me massively yeah. when i hurt my back and probably that could have been the only exercise i did and that would have really helped i think um tight but weak hamstrings sometimes can play a part and mm -hmm. because um, that can pull the pelvis down as well so um yeah. working on hamstring strength can yeah that is one of those that will help pull you out mm. of is it lordosis you know yeah. that overarched lower back anterior tilt. Um, so yeah hamstring yeah. so a swiss ball hamstring curl would yeah. be an example of how you could strengthen that. solid my, <laughs> my favorite one for like actual working the lumbar erectors i know what it is go on your Hyper frog. Hyper frog. <laughs> reverse hyper. Yeah. So you can do the reverse hyper um, on a machine. There's very few gyms mm -hmm. that will have an actual dedicated reverse hyper. I don't like those lower back extension. Oh my gosh, um, you can really fling yourself up, can't you? I don't really like, I don't like the pin loaded lower back extension. I don't mind the one where you're leaning on your quads and doing yeah. it. I think if you learn to do that, that's great. But I don't like the pin, but a reverse hyper done on a box or a bench I don't like the variation on a Swiss ball. You can do it on your sofa, actually, as well. Mm. I'll pop I up I tried it on a Swiss ball, and you, I just flung myself up, and I was like, just, crack! Just, like, well, that was a bit aggressive. Yeah. So I, I think it's a badly named exercise, the reverse hyperextension, because it doesn't actually hyperextend your back. If you do it correctly, it should just be called a reverse extension, because you should stop at neutral. 
you shouldn't keep bringing your legs up beyond parallel. Mm -hmm. um, you should stop at neutral. And the advantage of that over like deadlifts or a lot of other lower back, like lower back extensions on the floor, you know, you just lie on your front mm -hmm. and do that arch. I think that's the worst one. For me, I've got like degenerated discs on my lower back from doing too many flips on concrete when I was younger. So for me, lying on the floor and doing that arch or, or a cobra position in yoga hurts. Like mm. I can feel my discs, which is slightly bulging, pinching and pinching a nerve. But the reverse hyper actually decompresses your discs when you're in the bottom position. And when you pull up, it doesn't compress them. It just brings your spine into like a neutral alignment. So I think that is the best way because it's safe on your discs and it's actually really difficult. Mm. And then if you like discs are like healthy, but you just got a weak lower back, the hex deadlifts, like a nice beginner friendly, like I stop. do think deadlifts are great for your back. And I'm not talking about going at the heaviest weight and maxing out. Just a load of good deadlifts really help because that's mm. a movement that we, you know, bending down to pick things up is a movement we do a lot. And so many back injuries or pains happen from doing the most basic of tasks. I had a, a lovely lady who bent down to put a dummy in a baby's mouth and her back just went, um, my back went from just bending forward trying to stretch actually and mm. our back just went Poof. Um So yeah, just strengthening it, I'm not saying you have to go wild with it. I do think you should, if you're going to do a barbell deadlift, you should either you need get a train. I think you should get a trainer, even if you just pay for one session just for someone to teach you how to deadlift. Just find someone that looks more like an S&C coach style person. Make sure they're not, Yeah. Like, they probably won't get you to go too heavy if they're any good. And either pay a trainer or really pay attention to some like tutorials on how to do it. With the hex bar, you can still pay attention, but it's just a little bit like lower risk to reward ratio on it. Let's move on to the next one. That was a good amount. Um, okay, best workout split for muscle uh. gain. Okay, right. My thoughts on it. De I think it depends on how much time you've got. It de the definitely week. depends how many days a week. So I, I kind of split this up into my head into like a three day a week split, best three day a week, best four day, best five day. I think the general rule on this is, for me, in my opinion, the more days a week you're training, the more you can afford to isolate specific so like areas. Like a, I want to call it like a bodybuilding style. Yeah, bodybuilding training. split. And then the less you do, the more you have to cover each session. Like more of a f full body. If you've got once a week, it'll yeah. be a full body twice a week. I say, yeah, once a week, definitely full body. Twice a week, pretty much full body. Maybe pick different exercises. Three times a week, I'd still be going for like a very multi-muscle approach. So I tend to do like... Um, like a horizontal push pull with a little bit of legs, a vertical push pull with a little bit of legs, and then maybe more of like a hit and abs, you mm. know, like finish off whatever you didn't get done in the others. Yeah, it's a difficult one because I kind of have been taught a lot by you. Yeah. So I am going to say the same thing. Yeah. Well, you follow my barbell plant ebook, don't you? Ping. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to pop up there. <laughs> like, or that, uh, I don't know where he's going to put it. I can link it in the description <laughs> if anyone's interested. But And that split is, you probably know it better than me, but we that one tends to just pick a compound lift yeah. each day. So you have basically squat. a squat day, Hops. then you'll have an upper bench. day. So it'll be squat day, bench day, deadlift, deadlift day, and then and it's then an yeah. overhead press. Yeah. So I think that one is squat plus, is it ab work? More core work into that one. Yeah. It'll basically be a big, a, bit of an ab absent a big thing. squat workout with some leg accessories. Yeah. Then it's a horizontal push pull, so that includes your bench. I think day three is a deadlift yeah. plus some accessory lifts around that, and then day four yeah. will be like a vertical push pull, so it'll be like chin ups or banded chin ups. Um, yeah, so I make sure I get in those main moves each yeah. week, and that's and that's, what, that's how I prioritize my training following that plan. Cause it's not always the case that I can fit the full workout in because I'm yeah. for time. But if I get those big moves in, and then I normally will superset everything else, or yeah. um, if I want to get a bit of cardio and mix in the bike, or a bit of a EMOM or things like that. So that's what we're we talking about. Uh, just how many days a oh, week? Yeah, so, yeah. I think when you go into five, six days a week, you can start doing like chest i'd pick like mm -hmm. one big muscle one small muscle so maybe chest and bicep shoulders but, and tricep you know but i actually haven't trained anyone who trains that many times a week and i personally don't train that many times yeah. a week so i'd say my experience in that Those area areas. i don't i don't have enough yeah you do four day split though which yeah. is pretty decent um 
I, I train like that quite a lot. I, I tend to not like doing like, I don't want to do any more than like 12 sets on one muscle group. Like, yeah. So in, maybe a back. I could do more on my back because you can kind of go upper back, lower back, you know, vertical pull, horizontal pull. So mm -hmm. I'd say like the smaller muscle groups like bicep, tricep, I'm going to do somewhere around like seven to 10 sets. The bigger muscle groups like chest, shoulders, back, maybe I'm going to do like 10 to 15 sets and then yeah. legs also like within this muscle gain split we do need to mention rest mm. or break is yeah. it also important and has its place in your training plan yeah i found a good so a good uh, rule i found for writing a training plan even if you design your own plan is you want to train a muscle as often as possible as fresh as possible okay and if you follow those two rules then you'll basically get good results and that'll fit into your schedule. So if you like, if you're going to do, I like to do upper and lower focus days. If I do... Like do you mean alternating days? Yeah, it doesn't, it can have like, it could have like legs and abs, but if I do like three upper body days in a row, I guarantee I'll start to get elbow tendonitis. Mm. Maybe it's just because of age, because I was fine in my 20s. <laughs> but definitely, if you get over the age of 30, I have to do upper and lower. So, But I'll come back. As soon as I feel ready, I'll try and come back to... Let's say I do a horizontal push-pull. I need two days rest, and then I want to be back sort of training those muscles again as soon as possible. And that's the disadvantage with the bodybuilding split. It doesn't really follow the rule to train things as often as possible, as fresh as possible. If you hit your chest on a Monday, you're going to have to wait till next Another Monday week. to hit it again. Whereas if you do more like movement plane splits, I feel like that you can mm. get it done again, but you're not absolutely destroying your chest each time. But that's my view on bodybuilding. I'm sure bodybuilding so, uh, builders yeah. would say different. But how much weight should I aim to lose each week? Let's say someone is 20 kilos overweight or 10 to 20 kilos overweight. Um, how many? How much mm. should they aim to lose per week? I know what I think. But no, I'm I know curious what, the what you think. General first. standard is they say. Is yeah, but what do you think? What do I think? Well, I kind of think we need to look at how much they're eating to begin with. How much can we afford to pull back on the calories? Mm -hmm. um, what is a safe amount to lose? It does, sorry, what was the question? What's a safe how, how, how much, much How much do you think someone should lose on average per week? Let's say they're going to lose weight for six months. They've got like 10 to 20 kilos to you lose. Um, or they're going to lose weight for as long yeah. as it takes to get to their goal. Um, how much do you think they should like be aiming to lose each half week? Half a kilo. Yeah. I agree. Um, I think yeah. half a kilo. I go naught point. This is really. I'm thinking about the calorie numbers in a pound. Of, mm. Well, I'm always pounds when I'm thinking about it. I agree. I actually do naught. This is really specific. Oh, 0.5 yeah. to 0.8 kilos per week is a very good average. And that, for anyone in pounds, that's one, basically just one to two pounds. Yeah, which is. For almost exactly that, yeah. isn't it? So I find if I set someone a kilo a week target and you extrapolate that over 12 weeks, no one ever hits it. Whereas if you do 0.5, people can exceed it. And I've just like, after years and years, you know, I've tried to set people targets closer to one kilo. And I've tried setting people, and I'd say a client that has a good fast rate of weight loss is 0.8 mm. kilos and I, a week. And slow and steady is faster than really, really quick in a short space of time and you burn yourself out. Um, we recently had that um, a girl join us and she had her goal of a wedding and she wanted to lose, I think it was a stone over, uh, what was it now? I think it was like three or four months. Yeah. And it was like such a small amount she wanted to lose. Every, I think it was like half a pound to a pound, like it was yeah. barely anything. So it's hardly noticeable. But two weeks before her wedding, bam, she was spot on. And she was like, she it was so it. easy for her to stick to. And she's a... She's busy. She's working from Chester and Liverpool. Yeah. She's got a full-time job. She's planning a wedding. Like She's a busy lady as well, um, dealing with family life. If you're watching this, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations, because you're married, married now. And you look fabulous. Um, but yeah, and she loved it. And then she was like, I just want to continue doing this, but I don't want this goal of weight. I don't need this goal of weight loss anymore. And I was like, yeah. come and enjoy it for like life. You like, you're yeah, in you now. switched you're, to maintenance. Yeah, yeah. Like you're, you're in now. You, you yeah. enjoy working out, so keep going. So easy answer from me. Aim for 0.5 to 0.8 kilos, one to two pounds per week 
average. So you will that will not happen like that. That will be one kilo That's one week, no kilos the next yeah. week. But if you look at just your like, I think fortnightly, you should be hitting those goals as an average. There's no excuse. If you're going that way. Yeah, so you might go down. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes you might be like, duh, 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 duh. yeah, but you should duh, still duh, be duh, like, duh, duh. at least over a month, yeah. you should still hit that average. If yeah. over a month, you're like around the same weight, you can't yeah. blame fluctuation on that. You've, no. you've just not lost weight. Let's do one more. How to reduce <laughs> muscle soreness after workouts? Uh, how to reduce muscle People soreness? People are asking this. This is not yeah. my question. I think it's to be expected. If you're doing anything new, you're going to have some muscle soreness. Because yeah. it's new movements to your body. Um, it's it's going to happen. But how do you reduce it? Don't go too hard straight away. Yeah. Ease yourself in. Yeah. Um, if you're about to start I think exercising. that's a big one, actually. Yeah. The hardest thing I have with a new person coming to one of our like small group sessions too. is they're going too hard. Too hard Like too trying fast, to hold yeah. them back. And it's because they're motivated. And it's great. It's really good to see people coming in motivated. I'm like, no, you do not understand. Also, I think people want to get their money's worth for that. Like, they're coming in and they're like, right, I've invested this money and he's only making me do this. You see that with personal training? You can feel that impatience. And I'm like, trust me, people are... You will be able to get up the stairs tomorrow and that's not a good thing. And when I, I, like, sometimes I'll give in to that. Like, I'll give in to that pressure and maybe, and I'll think, all right, okay, no. That's what I I felt when I first started. I was like... And that's always when you get someone whiting out. If no one's yeah. sure what it's like to, tr- if no one's seen someone like really, uh, like suffer in a workout, what tends to happen is if they go. My rule is if they go red, it's fine. If they're sweating and go <laughs> red, it's good. When they start to go pale, yeah. you need to like recognize that turn in color and stop because their blood sugar is crash. It's just blood sugar crashing. And then if you just do one more set when they're starting to go pale then they can faint or throw up, throw or, up and, yeah. and then you can't get them back like we've got like an emergency uh, stash of like lollipops in the gym because it is just blood sugar crash and without mm. that we can't pick them back up again so that's the hardest thing yeah. with new people so um but don't for go doms, too hard. like i think you will like for example yeah if you go too hard or you're trying something new you've got you've got to expect expect a bit of muscle soreness yeah um I personally just kind of ride it out. <laughs> yeah. I know that you like to get in the, do the hot and cold, don't you? Ice bath. I, I think in an ideal world, um, maybe I'll do a little gym tour of where we are now. We're using one of my clients' um, houses and he's got a sauna and an ice bath next to it. I did suggest it. I did plug for it and thankfully he got it. So in an ideal world, I, so I used to use it after my American football games. It was the only way I could function again in the week. I, I was destroyed. I could barely go to work the next day. But if I came and did contrast, so ice on its own has not got, it's got good health benefits. It hasn't actually got like a lot of good results on um, like improving recovery. It does stop soreness though, to be fair. Um, but contrasts have a really good like studies on showing that it does increase your blood flow. Whilst just doing hot or just doing cold isn't necessarily the best thing. You want to op- open and close your blood vessels to get like almost a flush effect through them. So I go 90, 60 to 90 seconds cold and then I do two to three minutes hot and do it for as long as you can. I'll be like, like, back and forth. Back and forth, yeah. I do, I do it a timer when we're here. We'll do like 60 to 90 mm. in the tub. By that point, I'm starting to shiver. Yeah. And then two to three minutes, enough to fully warm up. And we'll do that for probably like 20 to 30 yeah, minutes. That, that well. is the best thing you can do. But that's obviously very premium. What about water? Just drinking loads of water. How do you feel about that? Does it make any difference? I don't think. I think that is good for you, but it will make okay. zero difference to your muscle soreness. <laughs> push it out. Doesn't matter, I don't care what anyone says. Like if <laughs> you do a hard leg workout and you drink a lot of water... It's not going to make still gonna get the dance. You might I, feel better the I next day because you're not dehydrated, but you're not going to get... I remember a few years ago when we were in lockdown, or not when we were in lockdown, what kind of gyms were allowed to train and blah, blah, blah. Um, it was those pistol squats. So probably one of the first few kind of times get, trying them. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Trying to get up and down the stairs. <laughs> it was just like the worst thing. Um, but then again, I just rode it out. I've got... And I know eventually it's going to stop. <laughs> I've got some funny advice on not being sore. My probably number one advice for not being sore is train more often. They'll avoid coming back because they were so sore. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, no, if you come three times a week, you're 
body will just not be as sore. Yeah, because like. it's not a shock to it. Yeah. Because also people equate soreness to a good workout sometimes, yeah. don't they? But like you said, if you're training regularly, you don't get that same soreness because yeah. your muscles are used to it. Yes, you push it and progress and you might be like, oh, I, I did a good workout yesterday. But you'll never experience that first ever DOMS. No. I have be. found, so I think with a new client, you should not do a leg day. We've, I've seen, we've seen multiple times of people trying this. Yeah. Um, I don't think, if you've got someone that's completely new to the gym, you should not do an hour on their legs. It's just not fair to the rest of their working week. Like, <laughs> <laughs> or their drive home. Yeah. They can't quite push It's just the not break. a good idea. <laughs> it's just there's two big muscles. Like, so I think you should train your legs. The key to like reducing leg muscle soreness is split your leg, your volume into more times per week. So that's what I started. I was doing more of a bodybuilding type split and I'd do one big leg day a week. Let's say I was doing 30 sets on my legs a week and I was just destroyed. I was so sore. I was just, I just didn't feel like I was really getting, not getting any benefit, but I was just destroyed yeah. for like the rest of the week. I couldn't train them again. I couldn't play sport properly. So what I started to do is I split my leg day into a posterior chain focused exercises and anterior. So I still did 30 sets a, sets a week, but I split them into like separate parts and I found that my legs were way fresher. Yeah, so I was training and it was going for that. I was training fresher with a higher frequency. So I was training like as fresh as possible, as often as possible. So I was getting better quality sets, doing the same amount of volume and less sore. And it's just like, why would you not train like that? So all of my programs now are designed basically like that, where don't smash a muscle if it can be split and still fit into the same week because you're just gonna get better. Imagine doing like chin-ups, you wanna do, what's better to do 10 sets of five <laughs> in one workout or to do two separate workouts where you do five sets of five one day and then five sets of five another day. It's definitely better to split them as long as you can recover in between, you've got yeah. the time. So I think train more often and break things up basically. And you That's won't be as sore. And you probably won't be like <laughs> but, uh, That's it. So if you liked this video, then let us know. Let us know in the comments below your thoughts on any of these topics. If you want us to do more, um, how did you find the setup? This is new to us. So if you've got any tips on like lighting, sound, or how you found it, or what topics you'd like us to cover especially, put it in the comments below. I would really appreciate it if you did like it, hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. That's really great. I'll link Sophia's uh, YouTube channel in the description below and see you soon.